Today I'm going to be talking to you mainly about the pork industry, food safety within the pork industry, and then I'm going to touch on how COVID has affected the pork industry. And like Clinton said, I work in genetics and sort of the biotechnology and agriculture side of things. So if you have any questions about that on the livestock side of things, I can definitely try to answer those questions as well. All right, today uh, what I'm going to do is talk about the first thing is what gives me the right? Uh, I listen to a podcast where every guest that they bring on, they always ask them what gives them the right to be talking about the topic that they're there for today. So I'm going to go over my story and really what gives me the right to talk to you today about pork production. I'm going to quickly go over industry trends in pork production. So what's going on with the number of farms, the number of pigs in the industry, um, and what kind of innovations and technologies are being included in the industry. Then what I'm going to do is give you a virtual pork production tour. So go through the pork production cycle um, and what happens at each stage through the pork production cycle. And then I'll quickly speak on food safety and pork production. What are all of the regulations and policies in place to ensure that all the pork that goes to the grocery store is safe to eat and that all of the pigs that produce that pork are being taken care of. And then at the end, what I'm going to do is touch on some hot topics in pork production. So some topics that maybe you hear about on the news. And if you have any questions about things you've heard on the news, then we can definitely address them then. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please let me know. I'll stop. This is a conversation and it's not just me talking. So what gives me the right? So my story is I come from a very, very long line of farmers. Um, my mom for Christmas this year gave each of us kids basically a pedigree or our ancestry of how long she could go back in our ancestry. And it looks like that on both sides of my family, we came to Canada on my dad's side in about 1847 and on my mom's side in 1867. Both were settlers in Canada and this is actually a picture. There's the woman that would be the second to your left is my great grandma, Helen. And this is on their ranch in 1938, just outside Medicine Hat. So farming has been in my family for a very, very long time. I grew up on a mixed family farm just uh, outside of Spiritwood, Saskatchewan. So it's about two hours north of here. And that girl with the really terrible bowl cut is me <laughs> on the back of my mom's horse. So uh, we, were, we raised, uh, we had a cow-calf operation as well as we had a backgrounding beef feedlot. And we also grew crops, um, so grains, forages, and then cash crops as well. And then my mom also bred and raised quarter horses. So I grew up with a lot of animals and around farming. I also worked summers in pig farms and in crop production retail, so I was exposed to that throughout high school and university. I then went on to university to get a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, majoring in Animal Science here at the U of S. And I'm currently, like Clinton said, working on my MBA focused in food and agribusiness at uh, the University of Guelph. What do I do for a living? Well, I actually, outside of those things, I manage marketing at Fast Genetics, which is a pig breeding company and what our purpose is is to provide commercial producers with breeding stock which can come in the form of either live animals or through semen. So that is our job. Uh, there's a lot behind it but that's what we do uh, at the end of the day. And on weekends I'm typically out at the farm. This picture here uh, is a picture out at my boyfriend's farm actually. They farm two hours west of here out at Kindersley and they farm about 20,000 acres of mostly durum, uh, lentils, and then also some canola as well. So I'm usually out there or my family's farm on the weekends. And at the end of the day, my passion is agriculture. I obviously grew up in it and I really enjoy talking about it and I love working in it. So why did I choose it outside of it's in my ancestry? Well, I went into, really went into agriculture out of high school because of the job opportunities and job security when you come out of university. Um, if you grew up on the prairies, you know that there's a ton of jobs in agriculture and I knew I was going to have one coming out of school. And that was it, really. I just thought that I knew I was going to have a job at the end of it. But coming out of school, I was really excited because agriculture is one of the most innovative and research-oriented industries in the world. And there's a lot of really amazing people that work in, on, in it and you guys are going to meet a lot of them here for the next couple days. Another point is that every person eats. Um, there's always going to be a demand for food, and the challenge is producing it in a sustainable and ethical way that will continue to feed future generations, and that challenge really excites me. And the next one is that the next 30 years are going to be the most important his years in history for agriculture. Out of the 10,000 10, years that we've been farming, the next 30 are the most important. And that is because of A, our population, 
B, our land usage and climate change, and then also the innovation that's going to be needed to meet those. So just some fun points on population. We've all heard that our population is going to keep increasing until 2050. Our population isn't actually increasing because we're having more kids. It's increasing because we have longer life expectancies and children are dying less. So we are actually going to have to be able to figure out how to feed older people and more of them. And we're going to have to figure out what kind of food they will need. The other is land usage. We actually already produce enough food to feed the world. The problem is wastage. In North America, we waste one third of the food we produce. And the other is North American obesity. I just saw a uh, data point last week that 40% of Americans are obese, and Canada is not far behind that. So we need to figure out how to redistribute those calories in a more efficient manner. And that excites me. <laughs> So why within agriculture did I choose pork? Um, I love animals. I obviously grew up around them and that's kind of why I went into the animal sciences specialty in my degree. Um, and then during school I was given the opportunity to work in the pig industry and I learned to really love working with them. They're incredible animals. Um, they're like no other and I just I really loved working with them and that's really what drove me towards it. Another is it's a really challenging industry. We are challenged with diseases. Uh, trade issues, and then pressures from consumers on how we should be producing pork. And pork is the number one consumed and produced meat product in the world, and that demand is huge and growing as our middle class continues to grow, and they demand more protein as you go into that middle class. So I wanted to touch on why aren't we at a pig farm today? Why am I in this room telling you about pigs and rather than taking you out to a pig farm? And the only reason is biosecurity. So if you don't know what biosecurity is, I took this straight off of the Canadian Port Council's website. Uh, basically what it is, is it's a set of practices in place that help to secure the health and welfare of the pigs in farms. Uh, pigs are really susceptible to diseases, much more so than a lot of other animals. So the reason that we have them in these biosecure farms and we have all these practices is to, to ensure their health and safety and welfare. So the impact that a disease would have on a farm, it, if it was to get in there, um, could increase mortality, it could inc lose production and resource efficiency, and it increases our reliance on medication and antibiotics. So the reason that we, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of it has to do with their physiology, but it also has to do with the types of diseases that are out there. Um, they're just a lot more um, transmissible, like we've talked about here with COVID, that there's certain diseases that are more trans transmissible than others, and the best way that we can protect them is by keeping them in these biosecure farms. So a lot of it has to do with that. Some of it has to do is, with, is that we've just kept them away from these diseases for so long, and they're naive to them. So if it was to come onto the farm, then it would devastate the farm. So the more that we've kept them safe, the more we've actually made them naive to these diseases. Um, so it's just very important that we keep them safe and secure. So the problem with bringing a whole bunch of people onto a farm is we don't know where you've all been. You might have gone to a truck stop where maybe a pig farmer had stopped at and he had a piece of manure on his boots that maybe had a disease in it. You pick it up on your boots, you bring it to a farm, and it ruins that farm. So that's kind of the issue here. And it, we don't see, it's just, a part of it is, the intensity of these farms as well, um, and just how naive they are to diseases. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. Um, so the importance of it is, depending on the disease and the stage of production and size of the barn, an outbreak could cost a farmer anywhere from thousands to millions of dollars. So that's why we aren't at a farm today, is just because of how important it is that we keep these pigs safe from anything that we could potentially bring in. Like even internally, we have our own farms, if I want to go from one of our farms to another, I have to wait three days between them. I have to completely shower in, change my clothes, and absolutely everything because we just want to make sure that those pigs are kept safe. Good, any questions more on biosecurity? Perfect. All right, so now I'm just gonna quickly talk about the Saskatchewan pork industry and the Canadian one really in general and what trends have been going on. So this will give you a good overview of where all the pigs are in Canada. Um, what you will notice is that majority of the pigs are in Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. They produce about 75% of the pigs in Canada. And at any one time, or there are about 7,700 farms in Canada. 
And the inventory of those pigs, meaning all of the pigs that are on a farm at any given time, we have about 14 million pigs on farms at any one time in Canada. And of those, 1.2 million of them are sows or mother pigs. So we typically will call a farm size based on the number of mother pigs that they have on that farm. And then those 1.2 million sows or mother pigs will produce 26.9 million pigs in a year based on 2020. Another important note is that 70% of all the pork we produce in Canada is exported. And the reason that we can do that is because of our food safety and security and really how efficient we are at producing pork. So in Saskatchewan specifically, we market about 2.3 million hogs per year. That's up 2% 2 2 from 2019. Um, but we actually have fewer sows or mother sa pigs with down 3% from 2019 and fewer farms, 9% down from 2019. So what those points say to me is that we have fewer farms and fewer mother pigs, but they produce more pigs. So we're more efficient at what we're doing. Um, another metric is the average farm size is about 1,200 sows. Um, and that majority of our pigs market, are marketed in Manitoba, Alberta, and the US. And the reason for that is that we only have one small packing plant in Saskatchewan. It's in Moose Jaw. So if we want to market our hogs, they have to go to those other places in order to do so. This is a little bit of a scary slide, but I'm just going to quickly, the whole gist of it is, is that farms are getting bigger and there's fewer, fewer of them and those bigger farms produce the most amount of pork. So that, that graph on the left is basically highlighting uh, the number of producers based on how big of a farm they are. So you'll see that majority of the producers, they produce about 5,000 to 25,000 pigs per year. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of producers that are in that range, which really isn't that big of a farm. It's about an eight to 900 south farm. The producers who produce the most amount of pork, there's only three of them in the province. So there's really not that many of them. But when you look at those same three producers, they produce by and far the most amount of pork in our province. And that's a similar trend across many different industries. My question for you guys is, could any of you figure out why those same three producers with the same amount of farms continue to improve or increase the amount of pork that they can produce? What do you think would be the main factors in being able to produce more pork when you have the same size of farms? Any questions? Guesses? Yes? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so there's really, in my mind, there's three reasons. Is these producers that produce a lot, they are willing to invest in really high quality genetics, nutrition, and biosecurity. They're able to keep their pigs safe, so they lose fewer pigs. And they have the best, like when you, people eat, they, the best quality ingredients allows you to perform your best, and it's no different for pigs. So they're willing to invest in the best quality ingredients. And then genetics. So genetics is really where it all starts. If you invest in good genetics, those pigs have the genetic makeup to perform in an environment that's perfect for them. So I always like to compare it to Usain Bolt. I, if I trained all that I wanted, there's no way I would ever be as fast as Usain Bolt because he's got a different set of genetics than me. So if we can invest and produce genetics that are all Usain Bolts but pigs, those ones are going to produce more, if that makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. So in general, this trend is common across all industries. It's not just agriculture. Uh, when you think about grocery stores or pharmacies, there used to be one small grocery store and pharmacy on every street corner. And now there's Safeway, Sobeys, Save on Foods, and they're big centers. It's the same with schools as well. If you drive outside the city, there you, you can see that there's school markers every couple miles because there used to be schools everywhere. And now there's just main schools and in centers, and that all has to do with efficiency um, and speciality. So it's not just agriculture that is getting more efficient and has bigger centers. All right, moving into pork production. Any questions on trends in the industry at all? Yeah. Um, actually, so in regards to the number of farms in Saskatchewan, I would say 95% of the farms in Saskatchewan, or pig farms, are Hutterite colonies. However, the size of farms is the opposite. So Hutterite farms typically only have about, in Saskatchewan, a 500 to an 800 sow farm, where those largest producers will have anywhere from a 2400 to a 5600 sow farm. 
those big farms. So hydrates make up the most number of farms, but they don't produce the most amount of pork. That makes sense, yeah. And that's similar across Alberta, and if you go into Montana and the Dakotas, um, Idaho, Washington, most of the number of farms are in Hutterite colonies. Yeah. But as more you go east, then it's all usually independent producers. Yeah. All right, pork production. So what I've done is I've put together some slides with images that are going to highlight the different stages of the pork production life cycle, like as if I was walking you through a pig farm. Um, it's the best I can do because we're not on a pig farm. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually highlight the different types of production within those, um, those different parts of the production cycle, and you'll see what I mean here in a second. So the first part of pork production is what we call gestation or pregnancy. That's really where everything starts is when you have those fetus, the baby piglets inside the mother. Um, where are we housing those mothers and what does that look like? There are a couple different options on how we house those mothers during gestation and reasons behind it, and I'll highlight the pros and cons behind them. First option is what we call conventional, or what we would call a stall gestation. Um, this is where the mother will spend their entire gestation, which is three months, three weeks, and three days. Um, and the reason being is we are able to feed them the exact nutrition we know they need for that pregnancy in order to to ensure that that pregnancy is safe and ensure that Sal is getting all the nutrition she needs to have good body condition and is healthy throughout. The other reason is that we can ensure that she's not fighting with other animals so that she's not going to lose her pregnancy. The next option is what we would call a group sow housing. So this is where the sows will spend the last two months, three weeks, and three days of her pregnancy. For the first month, she will spend them in that stall gestation regardless. And the reason being in those first 30 days, that is when embryos are implanting into the uterus. And in those 30 days, if she's fighting or she doesn't have good nutrition or she gets jumped on, she will lose the pregnancy. So in those first 30 days, regardless, she will spend them in that gestation stall, but then she will be moved into these, what we call groups out housing. In this groups out housing, obviously, they're housed together in a large group. And then you'll see at the front, that is where the feeders are. So instead of have each having individual feeders, there's a few feeders for a large group. And then they will each have to basically go in there at when it's their turn to eat. Um, obviously, you can see the pros and cons here. So pros would be they are group housed together. They get more exercise. Cons would be there's a lot more fighting and aggression. And that we can't ensure that they are each getting the nutrition that they need. The way that we have been trying to push towards having uh, better nutrition here is we've actually developed feeders that are able to individually identify each of the pigs. We have tags in them. So when they walk up to the feeder, it can individually identify them and it'll recognize if that pig has eaten enough for that day and will let it in. If it has already eaten enough, it won't let them in. So that helps to control the nutrition side of it. One thing to note about this is all farms in Canada by 2024 will have to convert to this group sow housing um, style for gestation or when they have each of those individual stalls, they will have to be able to give the pigs exercise for a certain number of hours per day. So those are the two options by 2024. Then the other option obviously is outside or what we call free range pork production. Uh, one thing I will highlight is 98% of production is indoor pork production because of biosecurity and efficiency. Um, but this other option, free range, uh, is obviously an option. Now pros, obviously they have, they can exhibit a lot more natural behaviors, they get more exercise, um, and it's more welfare friendly. Cons, however, would be A, biosecurity, they're a lot more susceptible to disease, predation, so there's predators that can get at them. Um, and then also we can't ensure nutrition when they are out there. So pros and cons to each of those types of production in gestation. Any questions here? Yeah. Yeah. So for which stage are you talking? This one? Yeah, so there are different variations of it. So sometimes there will be Throughout gestation, we'll have different phases. So we know in the first three weeks, she'll need, all of the sows will need this. They're, they're always housed when they were all bred kind of in the same week. So they will all be at the same stage of um, their gestation. And most of the time, I would say there's a, a general 
nutrition standard for all of them at each of those stages. There are some uh, technologies in feeding where you can, it'll be able to recognize individual sows and will give her exactly what she needs and will have different ingredients that it will pull into the trough. That's obviously a lot higher investment and that's more used in uh, research, but there are some farms that utilize that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good question. So it's actually easier to see here, but you'll see there's these slots here underneath. So there's actually a big pit underneath all of the farm. And through these slots, when they defecate, it will fall through the slots. And then that manure is then pumped out into a big um, system that there's a couple different systems for manure management, but it basically falls below them in all different systems. This one, it looks like where you see that there's the hard surfaces. You, you will likely have to go in there and scrape it into the middle, but down the middle you'll see slats and it'll all fall. Yep, some of it. Most of the time they try to have full slats so that you don't have as much shoveling management, but yep. Oh yeah, um, so most outside of some Hutterite colonies, some Hutterite colonies, they will do only natural service just because of religious beliefs, but by and far, most of the industry does artificial insemination. Yep. And how many um, gestation periods would it happen She would have about 2.3, 2.3 and a half gestation periods in a year. So almost a year. Yep, just about. So she will just stay for three months, three weeks, and three days. Um, she will have piglets on her for typically three weeks. And then pretty soon after that, she will be pregnant again. Yep. And how many years does that go on? A sow typically, we can have what we, we counted in gestation. So a really long, a sow that produces for a long time will be seven to eight to nine gestations. But not all of them make it that far. Yep, so some of them, it's, they're just not meant to produce for that long. Yep. Let's move to farrowing. So farrowing is basically the maternity ward of a pig farm. Um, this is where mother sows will have their piglets and will stay with them typically for the first three weeks of their life, which is the only the, the amount of time that they really need to be on their mother and have their mother's milk. By that time, pigs grow really, really fast. By that time, they're ready to be on their own and they don't need milk anymore. So they basically, what we call our teenagers, and they will move on to the next area. So in farrowing, there are a couple different styles again, and I'll explain each. This is what we would call a conventional farrowing stall. Um, where you will see basically a small pen, and then within that you'll have the sow within this stall, and then around her the piglets are free to, to roam. Now the reason that we have the sows in this stall has to do with uh, piglet survivability. So these sows, they may not look at, can be up to three to 400 pounds, they're very big girls. Um, so when they go to lay down to, for their piglets to suckle, they lay down fast and they lay down hard. And the issue with that is that they will t very often fall on top of their piglets and will crush them. So what these stalls were introduced to do was to help the sow fall down slower so that her piglets can get out from underneath her and she doesn't crush them. And that is the whole reason behind them. Now, there has been a movement to open up these stalls more so that the sow has more freedom. So this is what we would call a turnaround stall. So obviously you see that the sow has more room to move but, and the piglets have less freedom. And then this is what we would call an opening, open farrowing room where it's basically just there's no stall at all, and, but it's still indoors, and then obviously we have free range. So what, one thing to note is that as the sow gains, I guess, more freedom in movement, you will see increased mortality in the piglets from the sow either falling on them, and like you pointed out, is sometimes first-time sows have the tendency to sometimes have cannibalism. Um, it happens and it happens in some different animals. But so these stalls help to stop that from happening. Any questions on this stage at all? Great question. So traditionally it's 50 50. We're, I won't talk about my business, but we're in the business of we actually have the ability to sex sort sperm so we can guarantee a 
just about a full litter of females or males, depending on what you do. But yeah, typically 50-50 though. Yes. Oh, so they're just a different breed. Yeah, absolutely. So no, that no, yeah, absolutely. So I will say that it's a good question. So in the indoor conventional systems, you will typically see pink pigs uh, because they are conventionally, they produce the most pigs and they grow the quickest. When you go into these free range sort of niche farms and markets, you will see different breeds of pigs because they're marketing to niche markets. So maybe this one is very high meat quality or maybe one's really focused on like fat in the, in the pork. So there's different markets for some of those niche markets and they'll have different breeds. Yeah. So nursery, this is the next stage. Once those piglets are finished with their mom, they don't need them anymore. They basically become teenagers and move to a university dorm. And this is what we call the nursery. Um, all indoor nurseries look like this. They're basically just in a big pen all with each other and this is where they grow up. And you will see the slats underneath as well. So that's obviously where all their manure falls is underneath them. The other option is outdoors and it's basically the exact same setup, they're just outdoors. And then we move into grow finish. So this is where they really grow up to be a market pig. And it looks basically exactly the same as a nursery. It's just they're bigger pigs. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, for breeding, no. The only thing that's really seasonal in our industry has to do with heat fluctuations. So we'll usually see that in the hotter months, when you're breeding sows in those hotter months, they won't have as successful of pregnancies. So three months, three weeks, and three days later, you will typically see less pigs being born. And that's pretty much the only seasonality when you go into conventional farming. When you go into wild pigs, there is a little bit of seasonality. Um, not as much as you would think, but yeah. Yeah, so it depends on where you are, but in Canada, in North America, it's typically about 180 to 200 days old from when they're born to when they're market age. It's very quick. And market age is roughly what um, Nowadays, it's about 300 pounds. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So between... So first off, when you have a farrowing room, you'll move all the sows that are going to farrow that week into that room from gestation. After those sows are done there, there'll be a complete deep clean of that room before the next group are moved in, and that's the same for every single room. The nursery for grow finish, every room is completely deep cleaned every single time. Yep. Um, we typically would be about 24 hours, so they'll be removed from there and then you'll have your cleaning crew come in and then by the next day everything's dried down and disinfected, you can move those sows in the next day. Yep. Yep. So, good question. There are different forms of them. There can be one big barn. We call that a farrow to finish farm. There are also other forms. So some farms are just farrow and then they will send their pigs to what we call a wean finish farm. So they, will do, they specialize basically in farrowing and then another farm will specialize in wean to farrow or wean to finish. And then some of them will be a farrow to wean. They will specialize in farrowing and the nursery and then they'll, finish, they'll send them off to be finished um, elsewhere. So there's a couple different ways of doing it. Um, obviously it just depends on the structure that you know best. Um, like typically Hutterite colonies will be farrow to finish, but a lot of the larger, um, more intensive systems, they will typically be specialized in different areas. Yep. Anything else? Okay, perfect. I'm going to move into food safety now in the Canadian pork industry. So really what we have is five key programs that ensure food safety in our industry. The first one is what we call CQA, or the Canadian Quality Assurance Program. And basically what this is, is an on-farm assessment and auditing program that makes sure that the farms are making, that they are feeding pigs what they should be feeding them, that they're auditing them on their welfare practices, and basically everything that's going on on farm. So basically this is going to be a necessary um, program, I believe it actually is as of 2021, a necessary program that all producers are going to have to be signed up for and then they will be audited on a regular basis. So this is basically assuring your retailers, your processors and consumers that everything we say we are doing is happening because we are being audited on it. 
The next would be the animal welfare program. So this basically outlines all of the practices that we have in order to house animals, care for them, and then train employees on how to do that. Um, I've taken part in these programs. Um, they are very in-depth and most most, if not all, farms follow them to a T. We've, I know I've seen it, we've fired people because they have not followed these. So it's taken very seriously the welfare of our animals. Um, then we also have the transportation quality assurance. So this has to do with the transportation of pigs. Um, obviously in those situations where you don't have all pigs raised in one location, you have them moving from location to location, pigs are being transported. Then you also have them being transported to uh, processors. So every truck in Canada and every trucker that is in Canada all have to take this course and be certified to be able to do this. And this will cover things like how long can those pigs be on a truck for? How, what is the temperature that that truck should be at? When can you not transport them? What weather conditions are you not allowed to transport them in? Um, it covers biosecurity, where you can stop, where you can't stop, what roads you are allowed to go down for biosecurity. It covers all of this and every trucker in Canada must p pass this course on a regular basis and they must retake it. So definitely have that. The next would be pig trace. So because we have pigs moving from farm to farm, we have um, this pig trace program that allows us to figure out where individual pigs are going and we know where they are going at all times. So how we do this is each farm has a, basically a premise location identification. Um, and when pigs are moving from one location to another, they will get tagged with a premise location ID. And then once they move into that next location, um, they will, that ID will be updated with that new location. And the reason we do this is in case of any health problems, disease outbreaks, um, or just really for quality assurance and making sure the right pigs are going into the right places. So this is all tracked. Um, and then the last would be the National Biosecurity Program. So this program helps to protect the health of our national pig herd from foreign animal diseases and domestic, domestic health problems. So this is why we shower into our farms every day. Um, there's a full outline of what, what we should be doing for biosecurity protocols and to ensure the safety of all the pigs on our farms here in Canada. Um, and all of these programs are third party audited and they're envied globally. Yes. Yeah. Any questions on food safety and our regulation at all? Perfect. So why would I or pig producers care about how safe our food is? Why don't we just, well, you know, I'm just going to produce this pig. I don't really care how it's treated or what I feed it. People are going to buy it anyway. That's not the case. Um, we put these products on our own tables and feed them to our own families. Um, we want what we feed our kids, what we feed our parents, what we feed our friends. We want to ensure that it's safe. We don't want to harm our family. Um, and I can tell you that even within Fast Genetics, we all kind of, our perk is a pork perk. So we all get pork from our farms every year. So why would we be doing something to our pigs that we wouldn't want to feed to our employees and their families? So this is just something that it's, if you're gonna feed this to your family, why wouldn't you wanna make sure it's safe? And that's something that basically all farmers that produce food are in the same boat. Um, and we're also very proud to produce products that are known for safety and quality around the world. This is why we can export so much out of Canada. We export, like I said, 70% of the products that we have and the only reason that we can do that is because we are known around the world for safety and quality. So it's important to recognize that. Um, and if we didn't follow all these practices, um, we didn't, sure, didn't ensure that the pork was safe, uh, we wouldn't be able to market it anyway if we didn't follow the programs, guidelines, and audits that are in place. Yeah. Um, good question. Sometimes. So the pork industry isn't like the chicken or dairy industry. Um, it could be American. So it's funny. We actually export probably all of our highest quality pork out of the country and import poorer quality pork because other countries are willing to pay more for that high quality pork that we produce in Canada. And we really just don't consume that high quality of pork here, which is kind of sad. I think we should more, but there isn't really a demand for it in Canada yet. Typical, well, yes, typically it is labeled. Um, I wouldn't say that there's always a regulation, like you always see in the beef industry that they say certified AAA Angus Canadian beef. It's not as, where the pork industry isn't as good at that, but I know I see it around the city, you will typically see Canadian pork um, labels on a lot of the pork products. So I would say definitely look for it if it's available. Yep. Good 
Good question. So US is obviously a big player. They always are. Uh, but one of the bigger ones is actually Japan. Um, they require a really, really high quality pork product. They like a lot of marbling in it. Um, and we are able to produce that product here in Canada just because of the ingredients that we have and how good we are at our jobs. Um, so Japan is probably one of our number one importers, China as well. Um, we do see a little bit in South America as well. Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> That's how a lot of it works. Like we were talking about with Durham is we'll export it and then import it back. It's, yep. <laughs> yes. So that's a good question. So uh, if it's going down to the US, it typically will be live uh, because a lot of the larger pork, well, yes, a lot of the processing plants are in the US. So sometimes what we'll do in Canada is we'll produce pigs up until maybe that weaned age and then they will go down to the US to be finished close to a packing plant and then they will be processed at that packing plant typically. Yep. And then those other ones that are going overseas, that's always as frozen pork. Yep. Anything else? Yeah. Hundred percent genetics. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it's a combination of both. So basically, the equation for genetics is we basically give them the ability to have that quality. So they have all the genetic makeup to be as good as they can be. But if it's not raised properly, it doesn't have the proper nutrition. It's not in the right environment. It's never going to reach that potential. So it's a combination of both. What do they eat? Yeah. yeah, good question. So it depends on where you are uh, and what crops are grown in that area. So here in Western Canada, we would see diets mainly made up of wheat, barley, uh, canola meal, soybean meal, um, and then some other smaller ingredients, but that's typically what it is. But if you go down into the US, you'll see things like corn, soybean meal more. Um, it really depends on, usually you source ingredients that are local to you because of your costs to get those ingredients. So the further away you ship it, the more expensive it is. So typically, you try to resource ingredients that are local to you. And you said that there was a very specific diet mm -hmm. composition. So I assume there's some recipes. Yep. Recipes yep. Recipes. Yep, absolutely, 100%. So you'll, obviously, all the nutritionists in here will understand that each of these ingredients have different makeups of your macronutrients, right? So we know what the makeup of those macronutrients are and we will try to, we know that the pigs need this much protein and this much carbohydrates and this much fats and they need vitamin A and vitamin D. So they will make, use all of those different ingredients to make that recipe. And that's what feed males jobs are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would say a bit. Like you will see typically in beef, like differences a little bit in corn versus barley based diets. Um, there is a little bit in pigs, but I find that our diets are a bit more differentiated than cattle diets are. So you won't see as big of a difference. You will see if you go grass fed versus um, in the farm, there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, just because of the different ingredients there, but because the ingredients are so diversified, there isn't really that big of a difference when you go to, say, one that's more corn-based versus barley-based or wheat-based in pork, as much as in beef, for sure. Yeah. Yep. I wouldn't say most, no. So we. Yeah, we still, like 30% of the pork we produce is still kept in Canada, which considering our population, that's probably a lot. But we, what we do is we import, say, poorer quality. So like your hot dogs and your sausages and your smokies and things like that, we'll typically import and we'll keep those higher qualities like your pork loin and your hams and things like that here in Canada. Yeah. Mm. Not really as much, no, like, like I said, it's kind of, in North America, we have, I would say, poorer tastes for pork. We prefer really, really lean cuts of pork, which really don't deliver that much flavor, actually. Um, it's, 
domestic here in North America, we really focus on health more. So a lot of our higher quality, more tastier cuts of pork are usually higher in fat. People here in Canada and the US don't really want that higher fat because of the health profile of it. They think fats are still good for you. Um, but other areas of the world, they really value those higher, more flavorful, more fatty cuts of meat. So that's where they, they, those will go. Yeah. Anything else? I'm going to touch on some hot topics here. And if you guys have any questions about them, and then we'll be done, I promise. So, First one is antibiotics and hormones in the pork industry. Um, I'll touch on the easy one first, hormones. We don't use hormones in pork production. Um, everything has a hormone in it, every living thing has a hormone, but there are added hormones. Um, and we don't use them in pork production. And the reason being is because of how intensive our production is. It's hormones wouldn't actually make a difference in how efficient our pigs produce because they're in such a controlled environment. We don't need to add hormones to our production. They're already very efficient and the use of them wouldn't add any benefit for us. When you move into the cattle side of things, they're in an environment that isn't controlled, they're outdoors. So hormones allow them to be more efficient because of that. So we don't use them in pork production. So if you see hormone free, that's not a thing in pork production. Free of added hormones, we never added hormones. So. <laughs> Across the globe. Yep. Anything else on hormones? It's kind of a touchy subject. Okay. Antibiotics. We do use antibiotics. Antibiotics are used in people, in pigs, in cattle. And um, the reason is, is we want our animals to be as healthy as possible. We only use them when they're needed. So when an animal is sick and is going to die, if we don't treat them with antibiotics, we give them antibiotics. There are obviously different products you can buy at the grocery store that'll say antibiotic free or never raised with the use of antibiotics. In that circumstance, there's usually, we have actually have a couple customers that are antibiotic free producers. So what happens is if one of their pigs becomes sick and they need antibiotics, that pig will be given the antibiotics and then they will be marketed through a different, so they'll be marketed conventionally. So we still use antibiotics to ensure that animals are safe and healthy because we never want their welfare to be um, questioned. We treat our animals the best that we can and when they do need antibiotics and drugs we will give them to them and not any other circumstance will we do that. So if you see antibiotic free, it's because, well antibiotic free, everything in the grocery store is antibiotic free, I will say that as well. There are strict regulations in place that measure uh, how long antibiotics can be in an animal system before they are allowed to be slaughtered. So if we give a pig antibiotics, there is a certain timeline before they are allowed to be slaughtered because all of the antibiotics will be out of their system. So antibiotic free, all pork in the grocery store is antibiotic free because there is regulations in place to measure that and it is audited. If, it, if a producer does market pigs that have fine traces of antibiotics, they will get a hefty fine. Um, and that pork is not brought to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so there's all types of pneumonias, uh, mycoplasmas. There's endless, really, there's a lot of de diseases in pork production. Um, and we use antibiotics for a lot of them if needed. Um, I could probably list a lot of different diseases, but pneumonia is a, big, a major one as well. Yeah. Um, yes, there is some seasonality to it. So typically in the hotter months, typically with some diseases you should see less because they, um, they don't live as well in hot environments and they live better when it's colder. Um, but some diseases that doesn't matter. One of them would be PERS is a disease that we're really challenged with in our industry right now. It's a, porcine respiratory syndrome is what it is, um, and it has no seasonality to it. So it really depends on what disease it is. Yeah, no problem. Anything else before I go to transportation? Or do you guys have any questions about transportation or hot topics? I kind of talked on it a bit, and sometimes there are some questions as to how long they're allowed to be on a truck and things like that, but do you guys have any questions about transportation? I've only ever seen giant pigs in a truck. <laughs> yep. Uh, nope, they will be on those, you probably don't even see them because they're at the bottom of the truck. They're usually only about this tall, so you probably don't see them on the truck. But yeah, they are transported. Some of them not always on those great big trucks. Some of them are on smaller trailers. It just depends on where they're going. 
but yeah, they're definitely transported as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. There are a lot of them. Um, I'm just trying to think of the list that I want to go through. So the first would be have to do with what we call feed efficiency. So for us, sustainability, a big part of pig production sustainability is using as few resources as we can to produce just as much or more pork, right? So for us, a huge factor in that is feed. So we get feed, obviously, from the grain industry. Um, and we want to use as little of that, little of that as possible um, through feed efficiency. And what I do with our business is we do genetics. So what we do is we select pigs that we know are more feed efficient and we breed them so then that their progeny are going to continue to be more feed efficient. So that's one major one is we're using less feed in order to produce more, more just as much or more pork. The next would have to do a lot with manure management um, and your nutrient management. So obviously the manure has to go somewhere and traditionally it is spread onto um, land, which it is a really good fertilizer source. So that's one source of it is actually, it's a good, it is a good uh, fertilizer source and that's renewable. However, you do have some nutrients in there that might not be as good for the land or you have a lot of extra nutrients. So some farms, a lot of farms actually, the bigger ones are now investing in what we call biodigesters. So what that does is it collects all of the manure in there and what it will do is that manure, as it ferments, it basically creates this biogas that can be converted into natural gas, which is a renewable source that you can then heat the farm with. And then the water that comes off of that can also be recycled um, and cleaned to go back into the farm to be used as water. And then the actual solids that come out of those biodigesters can then be used for the land as well. So there's a lot of different areas in which uh, pork production is doing that, and a lot of it has to do with mostly feed use and, yeah, man manure as well. Yeah, no problem. Yes? Um, differs as in when we can transport them. Yeah, that's a good question. So obviously there's huge temperature variations um, from summer to winter, especially here in, in Saskatchewan. Um, and pigs are actually very terrible at temperature regulating themselves. That's kind of another part of why we have them inside, is that we can control the temperature so that they're always happy. Um, but obviously when they're transported on a truck, you have less control in that temperature variation. So what happens is we are actually able to rearrange trucks, open closures and close closures so that it's able to keep warm or cool itself off. Some of them have fans, some of them have waterers. Um, there's all types of different technologies that go on in those farms in order to ensure that the temperature in that truck is suitable for the pigs on there. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Anything else on transportation? Yeah. Yeah, so that is monitored sort of on an individual basis. So for example, for who I work for, we have multiple farms and we supply pigs across North America. So, but we want those pigs to arrive at that farm with no diseases, right? So they leave our farm with no diseases, but along that trucking route, who knows what they come across. So what we do is we plan routes through areas that we know do not have a lot of pig farms around them. So we know that there's not pigs traveling on those roads that often, and we're not stopping at places that we know that pigs typically stop at. So we will plan routes where we know are more biosecure than some others, if that makes sense. So it's really on an individual basis um, when you have transportation going on, but that's typically how it happens. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. There's Pig farms within the area are always communicating. For example, maybe one has a disease break. They will always let their neighbors know that they have a disease break and that they have to be very um, biosecure over the next coming weeks or so. Um, but they're always communicating 100% on what's going on. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. 100%. Yep. Absolutely. If you are marketing your pork at a packing plant, that is like, unless you're slaughtering your own hogs and you're just using them on your colony, that wouldn't be as regulated. But if you want to um, market your hogs at a processor, you 100% have to follow all these regulations. Yep. And that would be the same in any agriculture. Like if you have a few chickens and you slaughter them and give them to your neighbors, that's not regulated, right? But if you want to market your chickens 
to a processor that sells them to grocery stores, always regulated. Yep. Uh, farmers markets, yes. If you are selling your product to anyone, if you're technically selling your product, you have to follow these regulations. If you're giving it to someone under the table, that it's, you never know what you can do there. But yeah, farmers markets, yes. Can I move to African swine fever? Have any of you heard of African swine fever? Yes, so African swine fever really has been around for a long time, but we had an enormous outbreak in 20, August of 2019 um, in China. And what African swine fever is, is a really intense disease that we do not have a vaccine for. We still do not have a vaccine for. Um, and what it has is just about 100% mortality in older pigs. So it's not fun if you get it, it's not fun. You have to euthanize all the pigs on your farm um, and it's a really big deal. So as of now, we've been able to keep African swine fever out of North America as of now. And the importance of that is we are still able to market our pork products around the world. If we were to get African swine fever in Canada, our borders would close and we would not be able to export our pork products anywhere. So when we think about that we export 70% of our pork products, where do we think all that pork is going to go? It's similar to what happened with BSC in cattle in the early 2000s. It's kind of a similar situation as when you get one of those foreign animal diseases, your borders close, and all of a sudden all the pork you produce is worth absolutely nothing. So it's a huge deal, and if we were to get it on our soils, it would be devastating for our industry. Thankfully, we've had a lot of, a bit of time in North America to be able to put some regulations in place in order to stop it from coming here. Um, so we've set up kind of some zones where within Canada and the US that if either of us were to get the disease that we would still be able to market our products across the border. Um, but if we were to be one of the first to do that, it would have been devastating for us. Um, one of the other things that African swine fever has done is it's really affected a lot of the markets. So what happened is China produces half of all the pork in the world, half of it. They had 60% of their herd was lost to African swine fever. So that effectively left a quarter of pork production in the world was gone. So what happened initially was pork prices went through the roof which was great for us in North America, but we were also scared that if it did come here, um, that it would affect us. Another thing that happened is all of a sudden a quarter of all the pork produced in the world isn't eating feed anymore. So what happened to all the, the prices for feed is they, pro they went through the floor because there was no demand for that feed for all that, that pig herd over in China. So it's caused a huge ruckus around the world, not just in the pork industry or the egg industry, but a lot of different industries. And hopefully we can continue to keep it off of our soils because it's somewhat, as of now, sort of benefited the pork industry here in North America. But if it was to come here, it would be, it would be devastating. Any questions on that? Perfect. Any other questions? This is my last slide. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. 100% all of it is used. Um, here in North America, we don't eat it, um, but it is exported to other countries. So the Philippines, a lot of Asian countries, South America, um, Spanish countries, um, they eat a lot of more of those delicacies, um, but every part of the pig is used. Um, I should have put up a list of all the things that pigs, all the things that you wouldn't think of that are not pork that are produced out of pigs. Um, but every single part of the pig is used. And yeah, if you don't see it here, it is exported or turned into something else. Yeah, no problem. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you thought so. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, it's no problem. And if you guys seriously have any questions at all, um, I can give you my contact information anytime. It doesn't just have to be today or it's really anytime. If you have any questions about the pork industry, I'm always available. Unfortunately, I won't be able to join you guys for the rest of the tour. Just I'm in the middle of my MBA and it's <laughs> challenge me a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, it was if you guys have any questions, please, please ask me. This is something that I'm really, really passionate about. So.